Hey y'all and welcome to the new book releases for August the 14th where every week we go over some of the books coming out that week because there are like hundreds every single week, right? And I'm Morgan if this is your first time here. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. There will be timestamps per genre and I just hope you find something you enjoy and you'll consider subscribing. Also names and um, places will probably be mispronounced so I'm sorry but that's just yeah that's just gonna be the case. So Let's go. First up this week is going to be Fantasy with Thornhedge by T. Kingfisher. This one sounds interesting. I've, I heard somebody else talk about it. I don't know. I think maybe they have maybe read an early release or something because of the description they gave was maybe a bit more than just what this says. And I'm like, hmm, because of that. <laughs> There's a princess trapped in a tower. This isn't her story. Meet Toadling. On the day of her birth, she was stolen from her family by the fairies, but she grew up safe and loved in the warm waters of Fairyland. Once an adult, though, the fae ask a favor of Toadling. Return to the human world and offer a blessing of protection to a newborn child. Simple, right? But nothing with fairies is ever simple. Centuries later, a knight approaches a towering wall of brambles, where the thorns are as thick as your arm and as sharp as swords. He's heard there's a curse here that needs breaking, but it's a curse Toadling will do anything to uphold. Okay, okay. This next one is the conclusion to the Roots and Rose, nope, Rook and Rose trilogy. It's Labyrinth's Heart by M.A. Carrick. It describes the series itself as uh, a series, of, a trilogy in which a con artist, a vigilante, and a crime lord become reluctant allies in the quest to save their city from a dangerous ancient magic. Um, the first book's description would be, Fortune favors the bold. Magic favors the liars. Rin is a liar and a thief, a pattern reader and a daughter of no clan. Raised in the slums of Ned Nedzera? Mm. She fled that world to save her sister. Now she has returned with one goal, to trick her way into a noble house, securing her fortune and her sister's future. But in the City of Dreams, her masquerade is just one of many. Enigmatic crime lord Derosi Vagaro, Vagaro? Mm -hmm. Sony captain of the guard, Grey... Sarando, Sarando, dashing heir Leto Trementis, and the legendary vigilante known as the Rook all have secrets that could unravel her own. I've heard fairly good things about the first book. The other one might suffer from a bitter book. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll read this whole series because it'll be concluded. Maybe we could read it together. Mm-hmm. Our next fantasy, though, is called Vision by Rena Stone. Um, the reviews that were in on this one were mixed. I'll say that one. Her greatest dream became a waking nightmare. Eva has a world inside her head, the land of Astria, where darkness and corrupted beasts threaten eternal doom. Vivid dreams have given her four books as an up-and-coming author, but when undead fiends appear on Earth for a killing spree, she is caught in the crossfire between fantasy and reality. These creatures shouldn't exist outside the pages of her books, and neither should Imrus, the fictional hero who slips in from the shadows to tell her Australia, not Australia, Australia, <laughs> is facing its ultimate destruction. With the fate of her own world at risk and her main character's life being Drained by an age-old curse, Eva must choose between stepping up to the plate or watching every reality she has ever known crumble before her eyes. It says it's perfect for fans of The Witcher and Once Upon a Time. And now we will transition transition into YA. The first one being a thriller. It's called The Last Girl Standing by Jennifer Dugan. Sloan and Cherry. Cherry and Sloan. They met only a few days before masked men with machetes attacked the summer camp where they worked, a massacre that left the rest of their fellow counselors dead. Now, months later, the two are inseparable, their traumatic experience bonding them in ways no one else can understand. But as new evidence comes to light and Sloane learns more about the motives behind the ritual killing that brought them together, she begins to suspect that her girlfriend may be more than just a survivor. She may actually have been a part of it. Cherry tries to reassure her, but Sloane only becomes more distraught. Is this gaslighting or reality? Is Cherry a victim or a perpetrator? Is Sloane confused or is she seeing things clearly for the very first time? Against all odds, Sloane survived that hot summer night, but will she survive what comes next? It, it gives... Is this thriller and it gives B-movie 
horror thrillery vibes right there. It does. The next is actually a YA horror, and this is kind of a reimagining story. It's a horror version of Holly Hobby, because it's Holly Horror by Michelle Gebez Hebez Corpora. Ah, thought I could say that one. After her parents' painful divorce, Evie Archer hopes that moving to Ravenglass, Massachusetts is the best is the fresh start that her family needs, but Evie quickly realizes that her new home, known by the locals as Horror House, carries its own dark past after learning about Holly Hobby, who mysteriously vanished in her bedroom one night. But traces of Holly linger in the Horror House and slowly begin to take over Evie's life. A strange shadow follows her everywhere she goes, and Evie starts to lose sight of what's real and what isn't the more she learns about the lost girl. Can Evie find out what happened the night of her disappearance, or is history doomed to repeat itself in the horror house? And this is number one, so that means they plan for it to be a series. Moving into the more adult mysteries, we have a regular mystery thriller and then a cozy mystery. The first one, though, is going to be Lion and Lamb by James Patterson and Dunn, Dunne, Swinsiski, Swinsiski. Why are both of your names hard to pronounce? The city is in a state of shock over the fate of two hometown heroes, Eagles starting quarterback Archie Hughes and his even more famous wife, Grammy-winning singer Francine Hughes. One spouse is murdered. The other is his number one suspect. The suspect number one. Why does it say that? Why does it say it like that? Or right I say it. I don't know. Even before the case hits the courtroom, it's the hottest ticket in town for defense Cooper Lamb, private investigator to the stars, for the prosecution. Venia Lyon, a sleuth so bright she's got her to wear shades. Between them, they know every secret in Philadelphia. Together, they prove how two wrongs can make a right. They are Lion Lamb. I'm sorry I had to add that little bit at the end like that. I'm sorry. That might have been weird and stupid and cheesy. Okay, moving on from my embarrassment. The Cozy is Murder at the Library by Ellen Jacobson. Libraries are full of books and deadly secrets. When Thea Olsen agreed to volunteer at her local library, she anticipated shelving books and not stumbling across a dead body. Concerned her brother, the acting chief of police, is in over his head, Thea is determined to find out who done it. She investigates the murder with the assistance of her grandmother and the handsome new library director. Just when the trio of amateur sleuths hit a dead end, a snarky chameleon appears in the library with cryptic clues for Thea. At first, she's thinking she's hallucinating, but once Thea accepts the fact that the obnoxious reptile is real, she realizes he might just help her crack the case. Can Thea discover who the murderer is before someone else is taken out of circulation? It's supposed to be. It says, this is the first in a new library series set in the fictional town of Y, North Dakota. Okay. And fiction is actually our big section this week, but some of them are like, crossover fictions a little bit. The first one though is going to be The Invisible Hour by Alice Hoffman. One brilliant June day when Mia Jacob can no longer see a way to survive, the power of words saves her. The Scarlet Letter was written almost 200 years earlier, but it seems to tell the story of Ma Mia's mother, Ivy, and their life inside the community. An oppressive cult in western Massachusetts where contact with the outside world is forbidden forbidden, and books are considered evil. But how could this be? How could Nathaniel Hawthorne have so perfectly captured the pain and loss that Mia carries inside her? Through a journey of heartbreak, love, and time, Mia must abandon the rules she was raised with at the community. As she does, she realizes that reading can transport you to other worlds and or bring them to you and that readers and writers can have, and that readers and writers affect another one another in mysterious ways. She learns that time is more fluid than she can imagine, and that love is stronger than any change that binds you. As a girl, Mia fell in love with a book. Now, as a young woman, she falls in love with a brilliant writer as she makes her way back in time. But what if Nathaniel Hawthorne never wrote The Scarlet Letter? And what if Mia Jacob never found it on that day she was planned to die? But we'll move on. Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas. This one is fiction, but I feel slightly historical. It's a western featuring monsters. 
As the daughter of a rancher in 1840s Mexico, Nina knows a thing or two about monsters. Her home has long been threatened by tensions with Anglo settlers from the north, but something more sinister lurks near the ranch at night, something that drains men of their blood and leaves them for dead, something that once attacked Nina nine years ago. Believing Nina dead, Nestor has been on the run from his grief ever since, moving from ranch to ranch working as a no, truck, Viero, the hero, mm. but no amount of drink can dispel the night terrors of sharp teeth. No woman can erase his childhood sweetheart from his mind. When the United States invades Mexico in 1846, the two were brought to abruptly together on the road to war. Nina as a corandera, corandera, a healer striving to prove her worth to her father so that he does not marry her off to a stranger and Nestor as a member of the Auxiliary Cavalry of Ranchers and Vajeros. But the shock of their reunion? I can't even say the word shock. But the shock of their reunion and Nina's rage at Nestor for seemingly abandoning her so long ago is quickly overshadowed by the appearance of nightmare made flesh. And unless Nina and Nestor work through their past and face the future together, neither will survive to see the dawn. One of the reviews did mention though that the monsters don't play as big a role. I don't know, it could have been just their perspective of it. We'll see. Then we have a fiction sci-fi called The Great Transition by Nick Fuller Groggins. Emery Vargas, whose parents helped save the world, is tired of being told how lucky she is to have been born after the climate crisis. But following the public assassination of a dozen climate criminals, Emmy's mother, Christina, disappears as a possible suspect, and Emmy's illusions of utopia are shattered. A determined Emery and her Emmy, I don't know I said, oh, em, a determined Emmy and her father, Larch, journey from their home in Nook, Greenland, to New York City, now a lightly populated storm surge outpost built from the ruins of the former metropolis. But they aren't the only ones looking for Christina. Thirty years earlier, Larch first came to New York with a team of volunteers to save the city from rising waters and, territor and tor torrential storms. Christina was on the front lines of a different battle, fighting massive wildfires that ravaged the western United States. They became a part of a movement that changed the world, the Great Transition, forging a new society and finding each other in the process. Alternating between Emmy's desperate search for her mother and a meticulously rendered, heart-stopping account of her parents' experiences during the Great Transition, this novel beautifully shows how our actions today determine our fate tomorrow. And our last book of the week is The Book of Silver Linings by Nan Fisher. Yes, me. Constance Sparks always says yes. When her capricious best friend needs money, when her boss gives her more responsibility without a raise, been there, and when her boyfriend, Hayden, who is very kind but also secretive, asks her to marry him. While planning their wedding and struggling with anxiety about the right course for her future, Constance researches the history of her antique engagement ring and unearths the name of a man who might be connected to it, plus his tragic love story. When she finds a book of letters in his, her library's old manuscript section, written by the long-dead man, Constance is deeply touched by his words and leaves a note for him confessing her uncertainty and doubts. She's shocked days later to find a response tucked among the pages. As the notes continue to arrive, Constance finds herself quickly falling in love with the ghost and putting her real-life relationship in jeopardy. Will a bond based on letters and possibly sent from the past derail her future, or will Constance discover her voice and risk everything for the chance to somehow connect with her true soulmate? That's all the books for this week. I feel like giving the disclaimer, though I did know that the names were going to be tripping me up. Uh, saying it actually gave, had it happen more. I don't know. I hope though that you still found a book that you would want to pick up or add to your TBR list. And if you enjoyed this, maybe you want to go check out some of my other videos like this one, the vlog, yes, the vlog, <laughs> or any of my unboxings and reviews. And if you're enjoying my content, please subscribe. So that way we can keep growing. You can see these videos every week because new ones come out every Monday. And um, we'll have a giveaway soon. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope you're having an awesome day and finding something great to read. Bye, y'all.